BBC World Service. This is Helena Merriman with The Inquiry. This week, how has Rwanda saved the lives of 590,000 children? It was the largest gathering of global leaders the world had ever seen. In September 2000, 149 presidents and prime ministers met in New York for the UN Millennium Summit. The city was gridlocked as motorcades swept heads of state across Manhattan. At the end of the three-day meeting, a historic agreement. Eight Millennium Development Goals were announced. Specific commitments to tackle global poverty. A deadline was agreed. September 2015. And now, as that deadline approaches, experts are assessing which of those eight goals have been met. And there's one in particular that's getting attention. Child mortality. Because it appears that this is that rare beast. A good news story. Over the past 15 years, child mortality has halved. To give you an idea of what that means, it's 17,000 fewer children dying every day. It's an achievement which the UN has described as one of the most significant in human history. We want to know how that's happened. And to find out, we're going to home in on Rwanda the country that achieved the steepest decline in child mortality in the world. The UN estimates that over the past 15 years, 590,000 children have been saved. So, how did Rwanda do it? And could other nations follow its lead? Part 1. The Health Worker Army I wanted to be a priest. I didn't succeed. Meet the rather saintly Fidel Ngabo. My passion was really to save life of people. When the priesthood didn't work out, he chose another career. He became a doctor, where he did indeed save lives. As head of the Division for Maternal, Child and Community Health in Rwanda, he's led the team that's helped to reduce child mortality by two-thirds. After the genocide, the priority of the government was security. We started to really to develop programs of reduction of maternal mortality, child mortality, and 2005 is where we started to see really progress. They looked at what was killing children under five and developed a strategy. We had four top killers, malaria, diarrhea, pneumonia, and malnutrition. Diseases which can be preventable, treated by simple intervention. So we selected community health workers at each village. These community health workers would bring health care to Rwanda's children, since for many of them, Health centers or hospitals were just too far away. So when the children are sick, instead of spending one hour, two hours going to health facility, the community health workers can give the treatment in less than 10 minutes. To cover a country of over 11 million people, this meant rather a lot of them. We have 45,000 community health workers. Yes, you heard right, 45,000, the size of a small army, three community health workers to every village. They are elected by the community itself. So each village, which is around 150 households, they elect themselves, their community health workers. Community need to trust them because they enter in the house, they check everything in the house. Do they need to have any qualifications already? The only criteria we give is they should be able to write and to read. Once they are elected by the community, we give them basic training, like how to do screening of malaria, 
how to take um, temperature, how to take respiration. For complicated treatment, they are obliged to transfer to the health facility. On a typical day, the community health worker will do home visit, particularly with pregnant women or new mothers. They'll also see sick people who come to them. But here's the surprising part. They don't get a regular salary. Instead, they get a small amount of money based on what they achieve. For example, if they have 100 children in the community who need to be vaccinated during the month, we pay them according to the number of children who are vaccinated. If they have like 80% of children vaccinated, we give them 80% of the money. It's all about performance and it's paid off. Nine out of ten Rwandan children now receive all of their immunizations. It's such a feat that Rwanda is now advising the US government on its immunization strategy. What do you think other countries could learn from what Rwanda's done to reduce child mortality? The most important is to bring service closer to the community. That's what people can learn really from, from our country. He says there's another important lesson too. Accountability for each simple activity they give to you, you need to do it. In other words, you can have 45,000 community health workers, but without some accountability, without some way of checking that they're making those house calls, you might not see results. So how do you do that, both easily and cheaply? Part 2. The Tech Solution Well, I think the data really speaks for itself. This is one of the few countries that's been able, in just under five years, to reduce mortality by more than 50%, and that's, that's quite a remarkable achievement. This is Randy Wilson a man who likes data. He's been working in Rwanda for the past seven years, and along with his colleagues at Management Sciences for Health, an international global health consultancy, he's been helping the government with a mobile phone-based text messaging system. It's called Rapid SMS. We were part of the team that helped to introduce it within the districts, training many, many community health workers, with 45,000 of them to train, many of them who had never touched a cell phone in their life. It was uh, quite an endeavor, and it required kind of all hands on deck. Six years ago, thousands of community health workers gathered for a ceremony in the capital, Kigali, where Rwanda's first lady handed out some of the first mobile phones. Community health workers in the most remote villages would have been amongst the first people in their village to get a phone. So it was a big status thing. There were, of course, anecdotal stories about husbands not very happy when their wife got a cell phone, uh, but they didn't. <laughs> but I think uh, people have overcome that. The phones weren't just a status symbol. They encouraged the health workers to get out and about. That accountability Fidel and Garbo mentioned earlier. The system helps to ensure that people are in the community face to face with the patient and working. And when we see very few reports, I mean, it could be as simple as their cell phone has been stolen. <laughs> but uh, it often more likely means that they haven't been doing their job. So it sort of keeps people honest in terms of their daily routine. That's because these mobile phones are used by the health workers to do every part of their job. The objectives of the system are to provide a rapid communication between community health workers and other levels of the health system. It has a very simple message format. We've prepared and, and printed plasticized cards which have uh, codes for different child uh, health events and maternal health events. Such as? Um, the first thing would be that the child or the mother would be registered in the system, and that would basically be a short message with a code for registration, and then one or more codes for the diagnosis or the health problem. And then if there's any immediate feedback required, there are a number of SMS 
messages that can be relayed back to the community health worker. Here's an example. A community health worker goes to visit a mother and child for the first time. She sends a text message to register that child. Then, if the child is ill, she'll send another text message using a specific set of codes to indicate what's wrong. Normally, what will happen is that the response will essentially say if there's even the slightest of the danger signs that are listed in the list of codes that the community health workers are able to identify. It will encourage the community health worker not only to refer but also to accompany the mother to a facility where they get uh, proper care. And I think that certainly avoids a delay, which is often a cause of death. These early referrals have been a key part of Rwanda's success in reducing child mortality. With thousands of community health workers armed with mobile phones dispersed throughout Rwanda, children are now treated sooner, which means that fewer die from preventable diseases. It's all part of a vision of universal health care, pushed from the highest levels within government. A vision that's come to be associated with one person in particular. Part 3. The Global Health Rockstar She's one of the most important public health figures in the world today, if not the most important public health figure. She's led some of the most remarkable declines in premature mortality that the world has ever seen. This is Claire Wagner, a public health researcher. The woman she's talking about? Dr. Agnes Biniguaho, Rwanda's Minister for Health. Dr. Biniguaho had agreed to talk to us for this inquiry, but at the last minute was called away. Unsurprising, perhaps. She's in demand. When I go to conferences with her afterwards, there will be maybe a line of 100 to 200 people who want to meet with her afterwards or get their picture with her or tell her about their work in health equity. Claire Wagner got to know her when she became Dr. Beniguajo's research assistant in Rwanda five years ago. Dr. Beniguajo was born in Rwanda, uh, though was spent her training years in Belgium and France. When she moved back to Rwanda in 1996, there was absolutely no treatment available for kids with HIV. And she had just come from France, where there were treatment options. And in Rwanda, she was only able to prescribe rest and nutrition. And her vision for having Rwanda's children be able to receive antiretroviral therapy combined with advocacy from the First Lady led to an incredible HIV response that has continued until today. In the early 2000s, HIV funding started to pour into Rwanda. As executive secretary of the country's National AIDS Control Commission, Dr. Biniguajo was one of those deciding what to do with that money. One of her guiding principles was ensuring that that money didn't just tackle HIV, but that it went to improving the health system as a whole. The minister will always say that if you give me a penny to help my grandmother, I'll make sure that it also works for my granddaughter and that all of the investments that are coming in should go to build a strong health system. Claire Wagner's experience in Rwanda means she's one of those called upon to answer questions about how it's achieved such success. She recently co-wrote an article in the leading medical journal, the BMJ, explaining how Rwanda did it. Fifteen years ago, when Rwanda actually launched its community-based health insurance program, it gave the first health insurance to Rwanda's poorest million inhabitants, which is a signal to the world that this is going to be a new health sector that is focused on local ownership of the country's future. The insurance scheme had its critics when first introduced, but the government was determined to make it work, 
and now 98% of Rwandans are covered. It illustrates the resolve of the government to get things done. The government of Rwanda and the Ministry of Health has a set vision. And it's no secret that NGOs and other foreign investors who are part of the health sector in Rwanda work in line with the vision of the health sector or they don't work there at all. It sounds reasonable. Why should Rwanda allow NGOs to work there if they don't share its vision? But some have criticised the government for being too intolerant of dissenting views, something we'll look at in a moment. First, if Rwanda's had such success in reducing child mortality, why haven't other countries done as well? Part 4. Lessons from Rwanda I grew up in Venezuela and I joined groups that were volunteering in slums in Caracas. This is Jose Manuel Roche, our final expert witness. At that time I thought that with goodwill you could try to do a lot, but goodwill was not enough. You needed to know what could have good impact and, and where, what were the right actions to take. And that's how I started working on research. And so began Jose Manuel Roche's journey from fresh-faced, eager volunteer to hard-nosed, evidence-based researcher. He's now head of research at the charity Save the Children UK, where he's just finished working on a big report comparing how 87 countries have tackled child mortality. A good person, then, to ask about what can be learnt from Rwanda's success. The first aspect had to do with more funding. Rwanda is one of the six countries in Africa that met commitment on spending in health. They implemented some interventions that are really effective, for example, increasing vaccine and, and having more health worker, and a compulsory scheme of health insurance. On the other hand, they have made improvement in women empowerment, education, in nutrition, in water and sanitation, and all those are sectors that affect also the chances of children to survive. He says the real story is not the speed of Rwanda's progress, it's the scale. What we have looked in our research is that it goes beyond only a fast improvement. They have been able not only to reduce it fast, but they have been able to ensure that they, those that are more deprived, the most marginalised groups, are able to catch up with those that are better off in the country. So it's a, it's a story of fast but also more equal progress. He says it's all the more impressive as Rwanda went beyond the targets set out in the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, which only look at the country as a whole. One of the problems of the MDGs is that the MDGs were looking only at the national average, but they didn't look at whether those that were worse off were also making fast progress. And so the MDGs were blind to inequalities. So what happened is that many of the countries have achieved to some extent fast progress through reaching those uh, low-hanging fruits, those that are much easier to reach. So there's a group of countries where the inequalities are actually widening in terms Such of Such as, which countries are these? For example, Bolivia, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Iraq, Niger, Pakistan or the Philippines and Togo, those were all countries where some achievement were made in terms of reducing child mortality, but the gaps between those that are worse off and better off are widening. Vietnam is one of those countries where we saw that although they, they've made very important progress, some very poor ethnic groups were being left behind by having different language and because the information on health is not provided in all the languages, then they are often being excluded. It's tempting, he says, for health ministries to think that by targeting those children easiest to reach, the low-hanging fruit, they'll reduce child mortality faster, giving those countries good results when you look at their national average. Instead, his research has shown the opposite. What is interesting is that countries that reduce inequalities in child mortality were also achieving faster progress in the long term. So in trying to help every child, Rwanda has reduced child mortality faster than other countries. 
and it's taken a strong government to do it. Some might say too strong. There are sharp criticisms of its human rights record for jailing opposition leaders and obstructing independent civil society organizations. It begs the question, has Rwanda been able to achieve the success because of the authoritarian nature of its government? There are two things to say about that. On the one hand is that, of course, you need to have a government that can deliver. But progress in the short term, when you don't have the space also for change, for political change and democracy, would imply challenges in the future. There are, of course, other dimensions of well-being that matter, and some of those have to do with empowerment, with participation, with the possibility to speak yourself. This inquiry was presented by Helena Merriman and produced in London by Simon Mabin. Have a look at our website to find previous editions of the inquiry. Recent subjects include nuclear arms, the war on drugs and life for women in Turkey. You'll also find clips from our programs and how to subscribe to the podcast. And we want to know what you want to know. So demand an inquiry on the World Service Facebook page or by tweeting us at BBC The Inquiry.